Hi, my name is Ethan Rideau, and today we're going to be talking about metal 3D printing, but metal 3D printing specifically for manufacturing. Before we get started, just a couple logistics. Uh, there is a Q&A attached to the webinar. It's a function of Zoom, so feel free to chat in any questions you have throughout the webinar. I have a colleague on the line. He's happy to answer any questions as they come up. I'm also happy to take any questions at the end. If you have more questions or if there's any answers, I think the entire group should know. Just another note, the best view for viewing the webinar is the side-by-side -side mode. If you do have that option, not all options of Zoom have it, not all versions have it. But uh, I do have quite a few different metal parts with me today. Uh, so if you do have that option, I also have my overhead scope here where I'll be showing some parts in detail. So that is the best way to view the webinar. Like I said, today we're gonna be talking about metal 3D printing, but metal 3D printing specifically for manufacturing. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Just a quick agenda for today. We'll start out by talking about what some of the challenges on the manufacturing floor are and, and how additive manufacturing provides solutions. We'll look at what the promise of metal 3D printing is and a little bit of how that's specific to you know, printing in metal. We'll look at additive manufacturing based on metal injection molding, which is how the desktop metal products work. And then we'll look at some application examples and then a bunch of case studies, look at some of our customers and how they're making use of the desktop metal products. So starting off, you know, what are some of the challenges on the manufacturing floor? You know, currently, you know, we're seeing a lot of time, cost, and effort to bring up a new production line. You know, they may get a, a request from a customer to build a part, you know, like an extrusion die or something, or, you know, an impeller or so, any variety of different parts. And the amount of time, effort, and cost to start producing that part is very expensive. And lots of that is associated with, you know, lead time and cost of new tooling, fixturing, and jigs. You know, we're gonna have to set up our machines, we're gonna have to write some CNC programming, we're gonna have to even develop some, maybe some tooling, some different fixturing to hold the part, which is all very expensive and very time consuming. On top of that, you know, the, your MRO parts, your maintenance, repair, and operations components are very expensive because they're almost always produced in low volume and they're almost always quite complex. You know, when, when you're getting a request to work with a tooling material, like an like a H13 tool steel, you know, that's very expensive and very time consuming to machine. And then, of course, you know, everyone hears this, we hear this all the time, just machine shop bottlenecks. You only have so many machines, you're getting so many requests that, you know, eventually things start to, you know, get backlogged. So, 3D printing kind of helps with these challenges in two ways. The first way we're going to talk about is 3D printing for the manufacturing floor. So, what does that mean? That we're talking here about your tooling, your jigs, and your fixturing. So, you know, some of the things we're seeing people do is things like real-time tooling where you know, we're able to simply pull our file, throw it on the printer, and in a couple of days we have our, you know, our end use tool. Thing like, things like injection mold cores or you know, extrusion dies. Parts that are commonly very expensive to create, but now we can print them far cheaper and far faster. On top of that, we're now getting a lot of geometry complexity for free. This allows us to create better tools, tools that have you know, internal cooling channels or you know, more complexity that actually leads them to be better tools, but couldn't be justified you know, with traditional manufacturing methods. We're also able to offload a lot of work off of our CNC shop because now we can take a lot of these very, very complex parts and you know, just print those components, parts that may take days or weeks to, uh, to machine. Now we can just print those very, very, very complex geometries in just a few days. On top of that, you, know, you don't need to maintain this large maintenance, repair, and operation inventory because you know, this machine is so fast, so affordable. It's very common to be able to produce parts on demand when and where you need them. So that's really the first way, you know, really we're printing on the manufacturer or for the manufacturing floor. The other way is kind of, you know, on the manufacturing floor. So just a little note here on low volume production, you know, the first one to 10 parts are always exponentially harder to produce than the next 10 to 10,000. This is really true of really almost any traditional manufacturing method. If you go to a service bureau or you go to your internal machine shop and you ask them to make five of a part, you know, that part cost is going to be much higher than if you were to ask them to make, you know, 150 or 200 of those parts. This is because during these first few parts, this is when the process is being figured out and the fixturing and tooling is being developed. As you can see on the right here, you know, we have an example of a work holding fixture for volume machining. You know, it's machining a couple different housings that you're seeing being fixtured here. You know, those first 10 housings are going to be very expensive to, to machine because, you know, there's far more time per part invested in designing this entire fixturing setup. There's lots of scrap and there's lots of setup time involved. With 3D printing, of course, you know, there is no tooling involved. This greatly simplifies the ability to do low volume production. You know, what you're looking at on the right here is a sample build volume for a 16 liter shop system, which is one of desktop metal binder jetting machines. We can print all these different geometries that you're seeing on screen here without the need for any tooling. 
you could imagine, you know, how much cost and time this is saving us, where I can mix and match all these different geometries together and I can print them, you know, in overnight. This is making low volume production far, far, far easier than what it would take with traditional manufacturing methods. So, you know, this is kind of what we're talking about now with the ability to do 3D printing on the manufacturing floor. We can now start to do mass production without the need for tooling. So when we were looking at for the manufacturing floor, we're kind of talking about producing parts to, you know, work side by side with our traditional tools. We're aiding our traditional tools. We're, you know, we're helping our traditional tools. Here we're kind of, you know, we're kind of bypassing them. No tooling, we're able to do mass production all without the need for tooling. Just an example on the screen here of a bunch of different geometries that are all produced in shop system, you know, all produced without any tooling involved. So a little bit about desktop metal before we get started, uh, looking at some of how the machines work. Uh, desktop metal was found in 2015 uh, with the goal to make metal 3D printing accessible for engineers and manufacturers. And what I want you to take away from this mission statement is this idea of accessibility. Uh, metal 3D printing has been around for a while, but it's really been very inaccessible. It's been too expensive, too difficult to use, dangerous even, that it's really only being embraced by the very, very, very high-end industries like, you know, medical device or, uh, or aerospace industries. Desktop metal really targets everyone. Our machines are so accessible, they're so easy to use, they're affordable, that you know, that's the one thing I want you to take away from this mission statement, because you're really gonna see this theme being brought up as we're looking at how the machines work and how they're adding value at different customers, really revolving around this idea of accessibility. So Desktop Metal currently has uh, four printers. Uh, on the far left, you're seeing our fiber printer. That's our composite machine, printing things like peak and peck, carbon fiber, glass fiber, some nylons. Uh, then you have the studio machine. That's really our office friendly machine targeting at you know prototypes, one-off parts, making metal 3D printing so accessible. It's probably the easiest way to make uh, you know complex metal parts all from the comfort of your office. I actually have one of those machines behind me here today. Uh, the shop system and the production system, those are both binder jetting machines and those are really ramping up the production volume. When you wanna go from you know, 10, 15, 20 parts a week to hundreds or thousands or even thousands of parts per day, uh, the shop system and the production system, both binder jigging machines really allow you to do that. And we'll talk about, uh, today we're gonna really be focusing on the studio system and the shop system, but uh, we'll, we'll really talk about all these machines. So just looking at systems around the world, you know, we're shipping currently in 49 countries around the world. Uh, we, have, we have partners all over the world. So wherever you're listening uh, or watching today, you know, it's important for you to know that, you know, someone's nearby, happy to help at any point if you're interested in one of these machines. Uh, just looking at our customers a little bit, it's important to know that this technology, like I mentioned earlier, is very accessible. So that means it's being embraced really across the board, adding value at a, a wide variety of different customers from huge multinational conglomerates like Toyota and Google to some small mom and pop machine shops, the one or two man uh, you know, manufacturing uh, you know, agency or the small design studios. This, these machines are being used really across the board, you know, adding value really everywhere. So it's important to know this is unlike you know, powder fusion where it's really being embraced by the very, very, very high end manufacturers. We're really seeing this across the board really being used everywhere. So let's start by talking about the studio system, the machine that I have behind me today. The studio system is really our office friendly metal 3D printer. Uh, you know, it's safe for this office environment, it's very easy to use, it enables you to create you know, a wide variety of complex metal parts all from the comfort of your office. So, our approach was really to build uh, systems around the chemistry and powder supply chain of metal injection mold. Uh, this is true for both our studio system as well as our binder jetting machines. So it's important for me first to cover a little bit about how metal injection molding works. Metal injection molding is a powdered metal process. It enables you to create these very complex shapes and then mass produce them utilizing these inexpensive metal powders. Uh, it's used across almost every industry you can think of from, you know, uh, automotive to aerospace, consumer products, firearm, and it has these widely accepted and validated ASTM and ISO standards. Uh, it enables you to create a wide variety of different, uh, you know, parts out of a wide variety of different materials. Uh, metal injection molding is a great technology. I'll talk a little bit about how it works, and then I'll compare it to really to how the studio system works. So with metal injection molding, you start with your, your, your low cost metal powder. You're gonna mix that with a, with a, feed, with a binder, uh, kind of like a glue to create a feedstock. Uh, then you actually inject this feedstock into a mold the same way you would in a plastic injection molding process to create what we call a green part. The green part that comes out of the mold is uh, it's only being held together by that binder. It's still a little bit fragile. If you dropped it, you could probably break it. But, you know, it's metal powder with that combination of binder. We're then going to put it into a debinder. That's a solvent wash. 
we're going to remove most of that binder material out of the part. Uh, it's still not, you know, it's still only being held together with a little bit of, of a binder that's left over. And then we're going to put it into the furnace. The furnace is going to get just below the melting temperature of the material. It's going to remove that last bit of binder and we're going to end up with a strong dense metal part because we're actually going to have sintering happen. Uh, sintering is going to allow the, this metal powder to, you know, actually fuse. Diffusion is going to happen and we're going to end up with, you know, strong dense metal parts. So metal injection molding, right, it's a great process. It enables you to create a, a wide variety of different shapes affordably, very, very, you know, and mass produce those shapes. The issue with metal injection molding is the tooling steps. You know, we're going to talk a lot today about tooling, but with metal injection molding, you need this very large injection molding press. You have to have your steel mold inserts. So each different part I want to make, I have to have a machine mold for. So, you know, for example, if I want to make, you know, something like, you know, this part today and then this part tomorrow, you know, it's going to take weeks to get the different molding, the different molds. So we looked at that technology and we kind of thought, how can we make metal injection molding more accessible, allow engineers to create these complex metal parts, but without this tooling step? And that's really, you know, where, you know, the studio system came from. Studio system in my, in my eyes really stands on the shoulders of metal injection molding, where we're really making metal injection molding very, very, very accessible to the everyday engineer. So rather than creating this loose powder feedstock, which can be a little bit dangerous to work with, you know, you have loose powders, you need, you need respirators and you need vent, proper ventilation. We create a feedstock in the form of a rod. That rod contains all the metal powder. So you're never exposed to any loose powder. You don't have to worry about any powder handling regulations. It's very, very accessible, very, very easy. Rather than injecting this uh, feedstock into a mold, we're simply going to print it. We're gonna print it layer by layer, the same way you would in a, you know, an FDM print process to enable you to actually build your uh, green part. So for example, you know, the huge benefit here, of course, is no tooling involved. I can print this impeller you know, this afternoon on the printer behind me, and then tonight I can print you know, this chuck jaw overnight for tomorrow morning, allowing me to very, very quickly change the part I wanna do. All I have to do is export it out of my CAD software, load it on the printer, in a couple of days I'm ready to go. After the print step, we're gonna go into the D-binder. In our process, we remove about 80% of that binder material from the part, and then we go into the furnace. The furnace is gonna you know, get just below the melting temperature of the material. It's gonna remove that last bit of binder. You're gonna get you know, a strong, dense metal part like you see I have in me you know, here today. So, just a quick recap on the three pieces of equipment. The printer, you know, very similar to the safest and most widely used 3D printing process of FDM. This means it has familiar design guidelines, it also has these office safe materials with no powder handling uh, required at all, making it you know, very, very, very accessible. D-binder, again, targeting accessibility. It's got this low emission design, automatic fluid distillation and recycling. It's safe for your office environment. You know, the parts go into the D-binder dry, they come out of the D-binder dry, you're never exposed to any, any D-bind fluids. Furnace, you know, furnace is really an impressive piece of equipment. It's really the first office friendly sintering furnace. It fits through your office doorway. It's very easy to install in almost any environment. Uh, there's no residual stresses in the parts because we're heating them and cooling them uh, you know, uniformly. Uh, the, the furnace reaches a peak temperature of uh, 1400 degrees Celsius, allows you to you know, sinter a wide variety of different alloys to the highest material properties possible. So what do you, what's the result of this? We're getting what we call a you know, near net shape part. Uh, you know, we're getting the resolution, accuracy, and surface finish that's very similar to casting. Uh, we, co we commonly ref uh, compare this to a high quality casting. Uh, dimensional capabilities are about plus or minus 0.8%, but it's very important to know, you know, all these parts can be post-machined and, you know, they can be post-processed the same way you would post-process any of your, you know, traditional metal parts. So, for example, you know, if I have a, if I have a part and I need a, a, a critical dimension, I can simply machine a millimeter or two off that part to get that critical dimension rather than having to machine that entire part out of, you know, a hard to work with material, a stainless steel. These parts are also fully compatible with traditional finishing operation, things like tumbling, media blasting, plating, even welding and heat treatment. I'm going to switch my camera now over to my, uh, to my scope that I have with me here today, just to give you uh, a quick look at some of these parts in a little more detail, so you can get an idea of, you know, of what these parts are, you know, looking like. You can see here, uh, yeah, and I'll, and I'll show a lot of more parts today uh, throughout the webinar as we start to look at some of the applications. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, parts are fully compatible with traditional finishing operations. Here's just an example of a, of a mold insert that's being machined after printing, after sintering, I should say, just to achieve some critical dimensions. You know, another mold insert here, just having a sinker EDM operation done on that top face, just to achieve that critical tolerance, as well as that critical surface finish for the actual molding. Still saving lots of time and cost, though, because we know we're able to take 
most of the manufacturing operation off of the off of the you know the the sinker EDM machine and just do that last critical dimension. So working with a variety of different materials, 17-4 uh, stainless steel, very common uh, stainless steel, has excellent mechanical properties, also has relatively good corrosion properties. 316L, uh, another common stainless steel, a little bit better at higher temperatures and in some specific corrosion environments. Uh, Alloy 625, also known as Inconel, excellent at very high temperatures as well as in some specific corrosion environments. Uh, you have H13 tool steel. It's an excellent uh, tooling material. It's great for those hot and cold working uh, applications, but it's known for its excellent hot hardness, meaning it's excellent at high temperatures, uh, ex excellent hardness at high temperatures. It's also great when temperature is cycling, which makes it perfect for an injection mold core that's constantly being heated and cooled. Uh, 4140, another common low alloy steel, uh, excellent uh, hardness values as well, commonly used for you know end effectors, sheet metal tooling, uh, even some housings and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, copper, high purity copper, which has that excellent thermal and electrical conductivity values. So just a quick recap on the studio system, you know, really looking at office friendly metal 3D printing. You know, there's no hazardous powders, which means that any, no, at no point during the process are you exposed to any loose powder and there's no respirators involved during the process, making it very, very, very safe. There's none of these dangerous lasers involved like you have in a powder bed fusion process. You don't need any third party equipment. We're gonna provide everything you need uh, to get up and running printing. You know, it's very, very simple. It's all run by our software Fabricate, which you know, once you upload your CAD file, it's gonna tell each of the three pieces of equipment exactly how to run. It's very, very hands-off process. Of course, you know, no dedicated operators. I could train anyone on this call in just a few minutes how to you know, get up and running with this studio system. There's no welded supports. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about this today, but you know, in a powder bed fusion process, unfortunately, you have to actually weld your supports onto your part. Uh, with the studio printer, there's actually two print heads. One's going to be printing your, your metal material, and one's going to be printing an interface layer. That interface layer is actually a ceramic that has a much higher center temperature than your metal material does. You're gonna print that ceramic in between your metal support and your metal part. That ensures that during the sintering process, your part never sinters to the support. You know, so that way after sintering, it simply just lift it off of its supports. Uh, very, very cool technology. And then again, no special facilities. It's very easy to get the system installed in your office environment, in your lab, wherever you need to get the studio system involved. Targeting, you know, office friendly metal 3D printing, very accessible. So looking at the big business impact, uh, you know, really seeing big business impacts across, you know, a, a wide variety of different applications. Uh, talking about reducing product development timeline, you know, now we're able to do this in-house rapid design iteration. We're testing not just form and fit, but also function. We're avoiding these lengthy machining operations. And of course, you know, no tooling involved at any point during the process. Uh, lowering costs and increasing revenue, you know, we're minimizing waste. We're increasing our manufacturing uptime. You know, we're freeing up machine capacity to work on other tasks because this thing is a workforce. It's going to work overnight. It's going to work all weekend long. You know, then again, you know, no highly scaled dedicated operator required. It's very easy and accessible for anyone to run. Of course, you know, we're also getting this benefit of 3D printing of being able to optimize our part performance for the specific application. Uh, you know, many parts are designed for their manufacturing method and not so much for their specific application where they, you know, it's hard to justify optimizing the part beyond just basic function. But here, you know, since it is an additive method, we can often achieve these complex intricate geometries that are actually better for the application and actually are easy to justify with printing because we're not significantly increasing the part cost. In many situations, we're actually reducing the part costs. And then, you know, we can even produce parts that are just not possible with traditional uh, fabrication methods, such as, you know, mold cores that we'll look at that have these, you know, internal cooling channels to greatly increase the performance of the parts. So, you know, just looking at some examples here, you know, manufacturing jigs and fixtures, you have things like, you know, your drill alignment jigs, your robotic end effectors, uh, we'll look at a lot of those today, different work holding fixtures, different thread checkers, you know, a smartphone fixture to hold apart during an assembly process, just trying to get your idea, your mind thinking about some of the different applications specific to the manufacturing floor that we're going to be looking at. Uh, then you have your actual tooling, you know, you have your mold inserts, your die casting molds for, you know, zinc die casting operations, different coining fixtures for, you know, the metal and molding industry, extrusion dies, sheet metal tooling, you know, hopefully I'm getting your, your mind thinking just about some of the many applications that are possible specific to the manufacturing floor. So let's start, let's talk about some work holding jigs and fixtures, uh, specifically some end of arm tools. I'm gonna go ahead and flip my camera back over to the, to the, to the overhead cam. You know, for example, here's a, a robotic end effector. This robotic end effector is used for actually installing an O-ring on a hydraulic fitting, but you can see some of the small fine features that are possible with the studio system. 
uh, you know, this part would be very expensive to machine because of some of these fine features, but it's very, very easy for us just to print these, uh, print this part in just a couple of days. Uh, you know, the smartphone fixture, this is used for, you know, an assembly process where they're assembling, you know, multiple different electronic components onto this part. You know, it's a, it's a, a part that's very easily printed that, you know, may be quite complex to produce in other manufacturing methods. Uh, it needs to be metal because it needs to be stiff. It needs to be holding a part in the same location every single time. And you can see here, you know, we're actually able to remove a lot of material out of this part to just make use of that strength of steel while greatly reducing the cost of this part by in incorporating some of these, you know, lightweighting features that we'll talk a lot about today. You know, looking at injection mold inserts, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about H13. H13 is, you know, great for these cold and hot working applications, but it's very difficult to machine. It has this very high hardness value, which means you need very, very slow uh, cutting rates, high tool wear, very slow feed rates, but you know, it's very, very easy to print. So, you know, we're now we're able to print these very hard to work with uh, materials, you know, much, much easier than what it would be to machine them. So an example of this, you know, what we're looking at here, uh, this is a uh, mold insert for uh, molding the mouthpiece for an asthma inhaler. You can see I actually have the mouthpiece uh, part here. Uh, this part actually features a conformal cooling channel that actually snakes through the part you can see uh, in here. Uh, of course, you know, this is a part that by printing it to near net shape, we were able to reduce about 95% of the CNC machining time. Uh, we were also able to incorporate this uh, cooling channel. Actually, during the molding process, uh, cooling can account for up to 95% of the cycle time. So by utilizing an internal cooling channel like what we have here, we're actually able to reduce the cycle time by almost up to 40%. Uh, this allows for much higher throughput, you know, and of course throughput is very, very important injection molds because they want to produce the parts as fast as possible, and then they want to turn that injection mold press over to a different part. Uh, 3D printing greatly uh, shortened the lead time and also allowed them to produce this higher performance part. Uh, this part can be printed for just about $160 uh, compared to the traditional machining cost of about $930, and that's without that internal cooling channel. So, you know, about 83% savings, uh, so just a great example. You can see, you know, the, in, the insert, the inlet here is for that cooling channel and the outlet over here, you know, we're running that coolant all throughout this part. Uh, extrusion dies, you know, extrusion dies are, you know, this is an example of an extruder nozzle. I'm not sure how well this will fit under my scope here, but uh, this is used for extruding a ceramic slurry. Uh, it's used for actually mixing two different highly loaded ceramic slurries. It features this relatively complex loft that actually is very important uh, for the manufacturing operation of this extrusion. Uh, of course, it needs to be metal because it needs to be strong and stiff and it actually needs to be thermal resistance because these slurries are heated to a temperature to allow them to flow better. Uh, this is a part that is, this is like a classic example of a part that's very, very easy to model if you want to design it. It could almost be a, a loft tutorial for your CAD software, but once you've designed it, it's very difficult to make. It features this very deep channel that would be very expensive and difficult to machine. Uh, it, as well as just some, you know, organic geometry and organic curvature that are featured on this part. Uh, we could print this part for just $64. The traditional machining cost was almost $1,200. So a great example of a tooling application, we're able to save about 95%. Another great example of a part that's, you know, relatively complex, but almost always is being produced in low volume. They only need a few of these for the manufacturing environment, which make them great parts for the studio system. You know, another example here, just this, you know, extrusion die, of course, for uh, that, you know, very common 8020 profile, you know, a part that's expensive to, to manufacture, but again, produced in low volume because they only need a few of these just to pump out, you know, different profiles. It's also being changed a lot, so it's beneficial to be able to print, you know, a wide variety of different uh, geometries of these. All right, so let's jump into some case studies, starting with Alpha Precision Group. Alpha Precision Group is located down in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. They are a leading provider of highly engineering components specializing in powdered metal and metal injection molding process. Uh, they produce parts for a variety of different industries uh, and what they were really looking to utilize the studio system for is reducing their tooling costs and lead times. So generally you know they get a part in from a customer, the customer may want to order a you know a, a large uh, number of them because they're you know they're producing using this powdered metal process that's great for you know high volumes but unfortunately it's going to take them a while to produce those parts. Uh, or to, to develop the tooling to produce those parts. So they'd love to be able to reduce that tooling, you know, lead time as well as the tooling costs. They'd also love to engage with prospects earlier in the design process before they move to the mass production stage. So if a customer may call them up, they say, hey, 
I want to produce, you know, 10,000 of these components for some lawnmower or, you know, whatever product they're creating. They would love to say, yep, no problem. We'll start working on the tooling to produce that in high volume. But how would you like it if I sent you 10 or 15 of those parts, you know, this week? Because they can just print those on the studio system. They've printed, you know, hundreds of different parts. We're going to talk about just a couple of them today. But they're really making great use of their studio system. Uh, the part I have with them that you're seeing here under the scope right now, this is a end of arm tool uh, that's used to hold a uh, camshaft during an induction heat treatment process. Of course, that camshaft is getting very hot during the process, so it needs to be held with metal. Uh, they were originally machining this part out of steel, but they were having some issues with wear. Uh, the, the, the part was too heavy, it was wearing on the motors, they weren't getting the performance they wanted. So what they did is they redesigned this part, uh, making use of some of these lightweighting features you're seeing here, some of the coring that they made use of here, to actually you know, quite extensively reduce the weight of this component. Uh, they were able to print these parts in just a couple of days, get them installed on the, on the robot, and you know, now their manufacturing line is back up and running, and they're getting the performance they wanted. Uh, you know, th this coring, this lightweighting features that you're seeing here is a great example of some of the complexity you can get from metal 3D printing that, you know, it's, you know, it's totally possible to machine these little, uh, you know, cutouts here, but often it's not justifiable because it's going to, you know, greatly increase the cost of your part. Uh, and, you know, we may not, you know, be able to justify it. But with 3D printing, we're actually reducing the cost of our part by introducing these features because, you know, it's an added process. We're reducing the amount of material we, we use. We're reducing the process time of this component. So just a great example of a part where we're actually, in, in, you know, increasing the complexity of the part actually reduces the cost. Another part, uh, this is a, you know, a chuck jaw. It's used to hold a workpiece during a machining operation. I'll zoom in on this part a little bit. Uh, so, you know, almost every part that APG produces via powdered metal process needs some form of post machining done to it. Usually it's an inner diameter machine or it could be, you know, a hole tapped or drilled or, you know, something like that. Uh, this part is for holding a gear during the, you know, just on a lathe operation, just to machine the inner diameter to a critical dimension. Uh, you know, if they're producing, they are producing, you know, tens of thousands of this gear. So reducing the setup time for this machining process is very important to APG. By, you know, using a component like this, that it's going to perfectly conform to the outer diameter of that gear to allow it to actually perfectly conform to it, allows the setup time to be greatly reduced. This may not be a big deal if you're going from a couple minutes down to maybe 30 seconds, but when you're doing this 10,000 times, it's very, very important for them. So this allowed them to greatly reduce the setup time on the part by simply just printing these three different chuck jaws, doing a little bit of post machining just on that inner diameter to assure if it's critical, and then you know get it on the machine, get it up and running, and now they're you know greatly reducing the setup time. Uh, a part that's similar to that is this assembly line screwdriver tool. I actually have this part here with me today. Uh, this tool is used for actually, uh, it's actually used for screwing uh, screws in and out of this mill. So the mill in the background that you're seeing here is used for uh, post-processing of metal injection molded parts just to achieve critical dimensions. And then this is actually a screwdriver tool that goes into the spindle and is used to screw uh, you know, parts in and out of fixtures. Uh, you can see, I'll switch back over to my scope here because I have you know, a little bit broken down part of this, but you can see uh, you know, all the different complex geometry that was featured here. You know, the internal housing features this gear that's turning. Uh, there's some ratcheting components that I don't have in here today. But you know, the APG realized that the most time spent on turning over their mills that have socket head cap screws was actually the operator screwing those screws in and out. So what do they do? They said, how do I you know, get a, socket, a, a hex Allen key or you know, get the screwdriver into the mill? So they designed this tool that features, you know, there's different ratcheting components. There's some screw, uh, some, some springs and screws that would go in here. And then they, you know, they went ahead and designed this part. Uh, they then went ahead and printed this part. It features many different parts. You can see the outer housing here, you know, the inner gear, the ratcheting components as well as the top component that I don't have on this piece here, but you know, greatly reduced the manufacturing lead time and cost of this part. This is a part that they probably wouldn't have been able to justify getting their internal machine shop to make. You can see how complex this is, all the different geometry and features, but you know, they're able to simply print it in a couple of days, uh, throw it in the furnace, and you know, they're ready to go in, in, in less than a week. They saw about a 93% cost savings compared to if they were to have made this machine in their internal machine shop, and about an 87% lead time savings compared to their internal machine shop. A coining fixture. So coining fixtures are used to achieve uh, critical dimensions 
on metal injection molded parts if you don't want to do post machining. So what you do with a corning fixture is you load the part into a, into the corning fixture and arbor press, you press it into the corning fixture to ensure it's adhering to the critical dimensions. Uh, this is an example of a corning fixture that, you know, very easily for them just to design it very quickly, throw it on the printer, and a couple of days they're ready to start corning parts. They saw a 76% cost savings uh, with this part as well as an 84% lead time savings. Another part here, this is a thread checking fixture. They use this for their QA process. ABG wants to make sure that they're checking every single thread that they mold to ensure it's gonna operate once they send it off to their customer. What this part actually does is it pushes a, a thread checker into the thread on the manufacturing line to actually do the checking process. Uh, unfortunately, they had some wear with the original component. The original component was actually printed out of plastic, so they need to move over to metal. Very easy for them just to you know, take their CAD file, they threw it on the printer, the next day, you know, it's ready to go into the D-binder and they're, they're ready to install it in, in less than a week. Greatly simplifying the manufacturing process. They saw an 83% cost savings by doing this, as well as a 90% lead time savings. Just a great example of a part that, you know, accessibility really wins here. The ability of just how easy it was to print this component, you know, is something that's very, very important and valuable to APG. Uh, another milling fixture, this is the actual fixture for holding parts during the post-processing. Uh, the studio system allowed them to very, very quickly iterate on this CNC fixture. Uh, they were able to print these detailed different geometries that actually are able to incorporate the parts. Uh, they just finished off a couple uh, dimensions that exceeded the studio tolerance by doing some easy milling and grounding. Uh, and then they are actually able to rapidly iterate on these parts, something that they weren't able to do with plastic fixturing just because of some of the deflection that they were getting where they really needed metal. Uh, you can see this part. Uh, this fixture, you know, it's holding a metal injection molded part just while uh, the, you know, some secondary machining is done to it. Uh, another part, you know, this is a custom gauge. This is actually a part that's used to check the effectiveness of a coining operation to ensure that the part was coined correctly. Uh, this part was generally printed in, in a two-piece assembly, just ground a little bit to achieve some critical dimensions. Uh, you know, greatly, of course, reducing the manufacturing lead time on this part, simplifying the manufacturing process while reducing costs at the same time. So big business impacts for APG, you know, reducing their tooling lead times by 80 to 90 percent. They're reducing their tooling costs by 80 to 90 percent. They're eliminating these very labor intensive manufacturing processes by utilizing these new tooling designs that they wouldn't have been able to justify with traditional manufacturing. They're reducing their, their wear on their uh, end of arm tools by reducing the mass of parts like we looked at here. Uh, you know, and then we didn't talk too much about their on-demand customer samples, simply because, you know, generally they can't share those with us because they're, uh, you know, confidential parts for their customers. But, you know, they're doing that as well, while freeing up their machine shop to work on more critical tests. Great. Ultra Machining Company, located in Minnesota. Ultra Machining Company is a precision manufacturer, and they're a leader in producing these very, very complex parts uh, for, you know, medical, aerospace, and the commercial industries. Uh, they have state-of-the-art machines, you know, lots of different milling, turning, you know, wire EDM, sinker EDM, uh, 3D printing, and they even have automated inspection. They have a wide variety of material capabilities. Uh, they're an excellent partner for many different companies uh, in, in developing their parts. They really see additive manufacturing as a key capability across their entire product lifecycle. So the one thing that they're doing with the studio system is, you know, functional prototyping to test out manufacturing lines in advance of receiving their first parts from a foundry. So you can imagine, you know, they had to go to a foundry to cast a part in high volume. The foundry is going to take a few weeks before they start receiving the first articles back from the foundry. So what they do is they print that same geometry in a couple of days. They're ready to, they, now they have the physical part in metal. So then they can, you know, start to develop that manufacturing line that we talked about earlier. They're printing lots of custom end effectors, uh, something that we'll talk about a lot in a second here. Uh, different manufacturing jigs and fixtures for their machining process. And then, you know, they're looking to move to binder jetting as well to actually produce end use parts in mass, in mass quantities. Uh, you know, here's an example of some end effectors we're gonna talk about. These end effectors are used for holding uh, aerospace forgings. You can see the robotic arm here. It's gonna place that part into the machine. The machine's gonna do the post, uh, post machining just to achieve those critical dimensions. So they're gonna take that part out, put another part in. Uh, they use lots of different end effectors. They're part of the, you know, the automation that they're, they're striving to incorporate across you know, their entire manufacturing floor. They use a lot of different end effector models depending on the part that's being held uh, and the, the fixturing method that's being required. You know, if one of these were to break, you know, the whole manufacturing line has to shut down. So it's very important that they you know, are, are crit they're critical components. They need to be high quality. And they also need to be able to produce them very, very quickly. 
They, they, they're, they feature relatively complex geometry and they're almost always produced in low volume. You need just a couple per manufacturing line, which make them great applications for the studio system. Uh, the one we're going to be looking at today, this is a robotic end effector that's used for holding, uh, like I said earlier, an aerospace forging. Uh, uh, you know, by using the studio system, they saved, you know, over 12 hours of CNC time with this component. Uh, it went down for, you know, would have taken two to three days to machine each pair. Uh, we can produce these parts in just a couple of days uh, with just about one and a half hours of machining on a very, very simple bridge port instead of having to utilize these very expensive and complicated machines. Uh, we can print, you know, multiple geometries of these all at once on one print bed. So you can imagine I could have four or five of these, print them overnight, and they're ready to go into the deep miner the next day. Uh, each one of these costs about $28 on the desktop metal machines compared to, uh, on the studio system, I should say, compared to what was costing them $165. So about 80% cost savings right there. So immediately, you know, great impact, great part for UMC. Uh, switch over to talking about Egger. Egger Tool and Die, located in uh, Ontario. They are a leading automotive stamp and the leader in the automotive stamping and welding. Uh, They've been working on in industry for over 40 years, and they really have a broad aspect for additive manufacturing, looking to use it across almost all aspects of their business, from prototyping to low volume production, all the way up to their production tooling for doing those actual stamping processes and welding processes. Uh, they kind of have these three key criteria for additive manufacturing. If any project meets any two out of three of these criteria, it's automatically funded, they're told to go ahead and start printing, and they're given the kind of the green light. So cost, is it cheaper to print it than we can make it or buy it? Speed, can we 3D print it faster than someone else can make it or that we can get it in our own building? And then weight, can we minimize the weight of an end of arm tool or welding fixture in some way that's beneficial to us? By taking this approach, they have found tons of different applications and we'll look at some of these today. Uh, the first one we're gonna look at is this end of arm tool. So the original part you can see here in black was made out of nylon uh, with some steel inserts. Unfortunately, they had some issues with the performance of this part and you can see some of the cracking, some of the wear on this component. So they looked to redesign this part to be used on the studio system. Uh, you can see the new design is it's quite a bit simplified and they ended up getting a part that was uh, lighter, stronger, and cheaper than the nylon component. So right away they hit all three of their, of their key criteria and they're able to produce this part very, very, very easily. Just to, and you know, what's so great about this part, what I love about this part is once they changed the manufacturing method, they knew they were gonna be printing, they realized, oh, now we can simplify this part. We can redesign this part a little bit, remove some material, utilize that strength of steel here, and you know, create this part that's you know very very high performance. So just a great example right away from Edgar. Uh, stamping dies. So of course, you know, Edgar does lots of stamping for their automotive components, and they like to use this H13 tool steel for its excellent hardness values. Uh, you can see a couple different design dies here. The one on the right, uh, you know, it's been post machined on that top surface. Their machine shop loves when they bring them in a die and say, oh, I just need to take off a millimeter off of this to achieve a critical dimension, a critical surface, rather than having to machine that entire stamping die out of a very, very hard to machine block of H13 tool steel. So just a great use of how they're making use of the studio system to print these hard to machine materials. Uh, this is a servo, uh, a timing belt pulley. It's attached to a servo motor uh, used in their manufacturing process. The original design you can see on the left here, that was based on an aluminum extrusion. It had two collar plates screwed on the end with a clamp collar. It required some ex extensive machining as well as some uh, assembly processes. The goal was really here to optimize the design. They wanted to produce a part that was less expensive to manufacture, they wanted to lighten the weight, and they also wanted to lower the inertia to allow these servo motors to run faster. Uh, you can see the new design here, you know, it features a lot of those lightweighting features that we looked at earlier, you know, around the inside, it would be impossible to get a tool in there, so it's very beneficial for 3D printing. They were able to do all three of these things, they were able to lighten the weight of this part, reduce all that assembly time, reduce all those parts into one component, and that actually produce a lighter, stronger, better part, uh, and more affordable part, of course. Uh, last part we'll look at for Edgar, you know, this is a part that's used for resistance nut welding made out of copper. It features some uh, internal cooling channels to snake through this component to cool it, to keep it at an optimal temperature during this resistance nut welding operation. Uh, copper is a material we're working very closely with them to develop. Uh, they've been so happy with our H13, been so successful that they're very excited to get their hands on copper, get out there printing copper uh, material. Just another great example of how they're producing these, you know, higher performance parts for their manufacturing environment. So that's one of the big business impacts that we've seen with Edgar, really producing a more efficient manufacturing operation. We're able to lightweight these end of arm tools and welding fixtures to allow for improved performance, longer service life. So they're printing these H13 stamping dies without tying up their machine shop or you know upsetting their machinists when they have to machine you know these big blocks of hard to machine material. 
they're improving their factory floor, you know, machinery for faster performance. Now we're, you know, working with them on copper for these awesome welding applications. Ah, Prezio Francesco, uh, located in Italy. They are a sheet metal uh, machine shop. So they have a lot of different applications. Uh, founded in 1969, uh, they're a leading vendor of sheet metal cabinets, you know, gas and water meters, on-off valves, heat metal system manifolds, wall-mounted boilers, and gas reducing systems. So working with a lot of different sheet metal. Uh, they service mostly, you know, the energy, civil, and industrial plant sectors. Uh, they found a lot of different applications. We'll talk about just a couple of them today. So one of the main challenges for them is really this replacement parts for their manufacturing floor. So they're really exploring additive manufacturing to try to, you know, for these MRO parts, maintenance, repair, and operation parts. They need to reduce their lead time on these components so they get their machines back up and running faster. They're looking to avoid these CNC machining bottlenecks that they're having, you know, producing these parts while trying to reduce the mass to allow their parts to last longer, to reduce the wear on the machines, and actually allow them to perform faster and be more efficient. So the first part we're going to look at is this spring holder hanger. This is part of a paneling machine. Uh, this part is coupled with a gear that has a spring running through it to allow this arm to rotate. It takes about seven days for them to receive one of these parts if it's in stock, longer if it requires uh, it to be custom machine for them. Currently, that's costing them about 60 euros or about 65 uh, US dollars to get one of these parts. Uh, what this part actually does, you can kind of see the machine here. It uh, actually rotates. This component there that's rotating that sheet metal panel while it's in, inside of this express bender machine. So it's a very critical component. It's almost you know very directly in contact with the actual sheet metal panel, holding it in place, allowing it to be able to rotate for different uh, bend radiuses and you know different bends in different locations. So they also had some issues with the performance on this part. You can see some of the tear out that's happening here on some of these holes. Uh, so that you know, very quickly they were they wanted to utilize the studio system to replace these parts. Uh, they very quickly you know reverse engineered this part. They were able to add some strength. You can see some of the the rib that they added onto this part to increase you know a higher performance part, making use of that steel. And you know, they here here are the printed parts. You can see three of them printed on the right there, and they really saw four key benefits here with the studio system. Stronger, they were able to produce a part that was stronger and didn't have those tear out stresses and those tear out issues. And they also had the freedom to modify the design uh, to, to add strength if they need it. Faster, they were able to manufacture six different samples in just four days. They were ready to be mounted to the machine without any additional post-processing. They came right out of the furnace, ready to put into the machine. Cheaper, they were able to produce these parts for just 15 euros each compared to 60 euros each. So about 75% lower price and then less waste. Reduced material waste relative to CNC machining because, of course, it's an additive process. We're adding material rather than having to, you know, subtract all the material out of a, you know, rock block. Great example. Another part here. This is a sheet metal clamp for a punching machine. There's four different clamps per punching machine. Uh, the clamp allows the sheets of metal to actually be moved along the workstation. They're typically cut from a hot rolled metal block and then CNC machine, uh, CNC machine that have a two week lead time costing about 280 euros, about 305 USD. Uh, you can see the part. Again, you know, instead they were able to, you know, modify the design. They were able to, you know, model it up, throw it into our software that's gonna control all the three different pieces of equipment and then actually print the components. So again, seeing four key benefits here, lighter, just by using the studio system and some infill settings, they're able to get a 17% mass reduction. Faster, they were able to produce uh, these parts in just seven days compared to two plus weeks when they were buying these components. Cheaper, these parts cost about 176 euros compared to 280 euros. And then of course, less waste, additive process. We're not having to remove all this material just to be wasted. You can see uh, you know, the printed versions on the top here versus the original versions. They, they're you know, very, very, very similar, but they're able to take manufacturing in their own hands to produce these parts. Uh, the next step they're looking to do is some of this topology optimization, some of, you know, this coring features that we looked at. You know, this is actually going to reduce the, the weight of this part. It also is going to reduce the cost of this part because now we're using less material. We're lowering the process time of this component. And then they're starting to look at, do we really need this to be solid? You know, if we're machining this part, if we're cutting this part, yeah, it's going to be solid because that's going to reduce the, you know, the manufacturing costs. But now we have to kind of think differently because we're looking at that. Big business impact, able to print these replacement parts for their manufacturing floor. They're lowering the cost, minimizing the CNC machining labor and lead time. 
they're improving equipment reliability due to part mass reduction, and they're getting this design freedom to create designs that are optimized for strength and weight. A Corporation Ray, they're located down in Lima, Peru. Oh, sorry, just jumped a little bit. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Ah, located down in Lima, Peru. Uh, the part we're gonna be looking at today is these zipper mold inserts. Uh, these, you know, zippers, of course, are a fashion element. You know, they are used, you know, I have a zipper on my, on my vest today or my sweater today. I'm sure many of you are wearing zippers as well. And they're commonly getting requests to market test these components. They, they, you know, design and contacts them. They want to produce a certain zipper, but they only want a few hundred because they want to be able to test that part before placing a mass quantity order. Unfortunately, you know, these parts are created via zinc die casting operation. So they're quite expensive to produce because in low volume because of the, uh, the investment in the tooling. Uh, with 3D printing, we're able to greatly shorten the lead time, greatly reduce the cost of these injection mold inserts or these uh, die casting inserts to allow them to actually do these lower volume runs. Uh, what you're looking at right here is I have uh, one of the inserts uh, for you know, one of the different zipper designs that they're, that they're molding. And then you know, this would be just placed into the multi-unit die that I have here uh, to, to you know, actually do the zinc die casting operation. By just printing the inserts, they're able to iterate on the design very quickly. They're able to change the design uh, for different uh, zipper designs, allowing them to actually, you know, iterate. Uh, each one of these zipper inserts can be produced for just $15, taking about four days. Uh, compared to CNC machining, it was costing them about $120, taking about two weeks. So, you know, a great example, Corporation Ray, where they're able to, you know, do these zinc die casting operations, making use of these custom zippers. Uh, Bazigos. Bazigos is located in Greece. They are a uh, injection mold shop. So they are a leader in the design and manufacturing of innovative injection molds. Uh, Bazigos is working towards becoming one of the top ranked tool makers in Europe. So they're looking to do this by, you know, expanding their mold making capabilities, exploring new technologies to help them achieve this. Uh, their tool shop currently features, you know, 14 vertical milling centers, multiple wire and sneaker EDM machines, and then they have their desktop metal studio system. They're really making use of the zero system to help complement their traditional machining, which is a great approach because you know they're not trying to just replace something; they're trying to make it better. You know, they're they're using the zero system to help, to assist in machining, to assist in their mold design, rather than just trying to replace an entire process. Uh, the part we're looking at today: this is a cable gland mold insert. I have a I have a couple of different ones with me here today, as well as one of the actual cable glands that was molded with these. Uh, you know, this is for each different uh, size cable, it requires a different cable gland. This means that each different cable gland is gonna require a different mold insert. Uh, different mold inserts, of course, are gonna require different machining processes. They're gonna require slightly different fixturing, which makes these very, very expensive to produce. Uh, by printing these parts, you know, I can, I can print all the different designs for each different cable gland on the same print bed very, very easily. This means I don't need my normal fixturing, my normal fixturing and it greatly accelerated the manufacturing lead time on these parts. Uh, post machining was less than one hour per part, uh, just to uh, just to machine some of the critical surfaces where the actual molding is going to take place. Uh, these parts could each be produced for just twenty six dollars. The traditional cost was you know two hundred six dollars per part. Uh, so this is about an eighty seven percent cost savings. Another great example of just some mold inserts uh, that can be printed on the studio system. This one, of course, is for plastic injection molding. Uh, you can see just some close ups of the of the actual printed parts. Big business effect for them, you know, they're introducing this new low cost manufacturing capability. They're able to produce molds for customers faster while freeing up CNC capacity. And now they're looking to incorporate some of these higher performance molds, incorporating some of these conformal cooling channels that just couldn't be manufactured with traditional manufacturing operations. So now let's transition a little bit to talking about mass production of metal parts. We've talked a lot about uh, you know, 3D printing for the, for the manufacturing floor. But what about 3D printing on the manufacturing floor where we're mass producing these parts? The shop system. The shop system is really the world's first metal binder jetting system that's designed specifically for machine shops. Uh, we've learned to use uh, these metal injection molding powders for both you know, the studio system, which is that we call it bound metal deposition, as well as the binder jetting process. Both of these processes are making use of metal powder, organic binders, and then in the furnace, we're gonna remove you know, some of that binder and we're gonna center those parts to high volume. But in the binder jetting process, we're able to print much faster. A little bit about how binder jetting works, uh, as you can note by the name, it's jetting binder. So this is a powdered metal process. We have a powder feed box on the right. That's, that's incorporating our low cost metal injection molding powder. And then we have our build box on the left. 
Uh, the roller is gonna spread a thin layer, just fight 50 microns thick across the build box. And then the print head's gonna come across and jet binder onto that, uh, onto that build box. Uh, the print head's gonna be able to print an entire layer in just a few seconds, allowing us to print many, many parts very, very quickly. In this example, our jigsaw puzzle pieces are our actual parts. And uh, you know, of course, this print head's only gonna jet binder uh, where that part is on that layer. You know, the pillbox then, of course, is going to lower by a layer. We're going to spread another layer of powder, and we can print another layer uh, very, very quickly. This allows us to print, you know, entire build boxes of multiple different parts very quickly. After printing, we're going to depowder all the parts. We're going to put them into the furnace. Uh, the furnace is first going to do a thermal debind, where it's going to remove that binder material. And then we're going to go up to a sintering temperature, where we're actually going to sinter our parts. We're going to get those strong, dense metal parts that people are expecting. The shop system really provides unparalleled productivity. If we're looking at the build box, uh, example build box on the right here, and you can see all these different geometries that are able to be printed all at once, all together. You can imagine asking your machinist to machine all of these different components. You know, they would need different fixturing, many different manufacturing operations. They would need time to program different CNCs versus, you know, we can set up this entire build in just one to two hours. You can print overnight. The parts are ready to go into the furnace, you know. You're getting all these parts in just a few days. So this allows us to prove, you know, various different part geometries all simultaneously without the need for multiple setups. You can also produce, you know, hundreds of near-net shaped parts every day with dramatically reduced labor costs, well expanded geometry flexibility, of course, because we're working with a 3D printing technology. Uh, the system really allows you to reduce costs. You know, of course, we're limiting tooling. We're printing our parts without the need for molds or we're holding fixtures, which is going to reduce costs. We're reducing our tool wear because we're printing and centering our parts. We're only doing any machining if we need to do any critical dimensions. We're greatly reducing our labor costs. The printer's a workhorse. It's going to run overnight. It's going to run over the weekend, producing parts with very little operator burned. We don't need to scale our machine at a time with the number of parts we want to produce. We can reduce our job setup costs. We can set up an entire build in just one to two hours, regardless of the, of the part complexity, compared to you know, hours, of hours per geometry with a CNC process. And then of course, you know, we're reducing our manufacturing steps. We're printing these parts in internet shape, rather than you know, for some parts you'd have, to, you know, you'd have to cut the stock, you'd have to mill the part, maybe do some lathe operations, some drilling, some tapping operations. All that's just to reduce your just one print process. It's very common with 3D printing to talk about reducing costs. But with this system, now we're actually able to increase revenue. If you're a machine shop that ends up with a shop system, you know, now we're going to increase revenue because now we can produce previously unattainable geometries. We can do assembly consolidation. We do design optimization far beyond what's possible with CNC machining. This is a new, this is a new benefit, a new technology that you can offer to your customers. We can print hard to machine materials far more affordably. Things like your H13 or your Inconel. You know, things that are not possible with layered bed fusion, so we can get those same, uh, you know, geometry benefits with these, you know, complex, hard to machine materials. We can make these small and medium sized jobs economically viable. You know, now we can bring a new business that previously would have had to simply no bid. Uh, you know, if there was high tooling costs involved with a part, you know, maybe we couldn't justify producing that part in low volume, but now we can simply throw it on the printer. Maybe we combine it with some other parts we're already printing, and, you know, we can now t win, win some new business, you know, win new, win more win more jobs, improve part costs, improve part costs, and, and then reduce, uh, you know, lead times. And then of course, you know, this is actually gonna free up a lot of CNC capacity in our shop for new jobs, because it's really a workhorse. It's gonna be producing a lot, a lot of parts. And now we can offload a lot of our CNC work onto the shop system. Uh, looking at a lot of different geometries, we'll look at just a couple different part examples today. Uh, we have entire webinars dedicated to the shop if you're interested in learning more about the shop system, uh, but it's a really, really awesome machine. Uh, produces tons of parts every day. Uh, looking at some more geometries, just you know, located around the office, we'll look at a couple of different part examples. Uh, this is an output pulley. This is part of the retraction mechanism uh, on a car seatbelt. Uh, time to market was significantly faster than what it was going to be with traditional manufacturing. Uh, this part features some relatively complex tooling. It requires some side up, a side action uh, sliders for the molding process that would have made this part very expensive. Uh, fortunately, you know, we can simply just print this part on the shop system. Uh, this part's produced in 17 4 stainless steel, about $6.75 per part, about 275 of these parts per build. Uh, that means we're doing about 2,100 of these parts every single week. So you can see we're really increasing the throughput uh, by moving to the shop system with those binder jetting machines. Uh, the swivel base. This is a rotating machine component. This is a geometry that's very difficult or impossible to cast due to some of the internal features. Uh, the intricate features as well as those internal features make it an excellent candidate for the shop system. 
The shop system is printing parts layer by layer. That means these are organic curvatures and these internal features are just are no problem. To print. Uh, each one of these can be printed for just eight dollars and forty cents. Produce about two hundred ninety three of these per build. About seventeen hundred of these per week. So again, you know, really moving the volume up, producing you know higher volumes. Last part we'll look at here. This is the end cap for a pneumatic piston. You know, machining of this part required multiple different setups as well as over 50% material removal. This part cost is well over $50 when it's being machined in quantities under 1,000. So with the shop system, we were able to greatly reduce the cost of manufacturing lead time because we didn't need to you know, produce that many of these. The, the, the customer only needed you know, 25, 30 of these parts. It also greatly mitigates the risk because we're not investing in this volume machining fixturing where you know, if the part design changes, that fixturing is also gonna have to change. Where here, you know, I can print 46 of these in the first build, or I can even print five of these in the first build. If I want to tweak the design, I can, I can upload a different you know, design of the printer the next day. This part can be produced for just $42.64, do about 46 of them per build, do about 296 of these per week. So again, you know, really seeing that volume increase. That's all I have for you today. I really thank you for joining me. I, I, I hope everyone learned something. They were able to take advantage of this uh, webinar. Uh, I'd love to explore what additive manufacturing can do for your business. I'd love to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting between you and myself or one of my colleagues uh, to see, kind of take a look at your manufacturing environment, look at your design process, and see how metal 3D printing uh, could help, you know, help your help your company. Uh, we'd love to see which metal 3D printing system might make sense for you. Uh, we'd also love to give you a free part assessment with some key metrics. If you want to send me a CAD file, I'm happy to look at the part, let you know if I think you'd be a good part for our process. Uh, any of our printers, as well as give you some uh, costing on that part. I can tell you how much it would cost on our machines, as well as, as, well as uh, what the throughput would be on those machines. If everything's looking good, of course, we're happy to give you a free part of sample to help you with, the, you know, with your process of you know, deciding whether or not these machines make sense for you. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, feel free to email me. I'm Ethan at desktopmetal.com. We're going to be doing a lot of these events, so feel free to head over to desktopmetal.com slash connect slash events where you can sign up for you know a variety of different webinars if you want to learn more about the studio system for different industries. Maybe you want to hear about the shop system or the fiber system. Head over to our website. If you want to hear more about material properties, finishing properties. We're doing tons of these webinars. So feel free to sign up for more of these. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join me. Uh, thank